Gospel, chapter 22, and verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. Uh, we know that we're approaching the time of our Easter celebration, resurrection celebration. And it's also the time of the Jews' Passover. Most of us, I think, understand what the Passover is about in the book of Exodus when the children of Israel were in bondage in Egypt and they cried out to the Lord and God sent them a deliverer. Moses went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go, and he wouldn't, and God began to send plagues on the Egyptians. And the very last plague, God sent the death angel. There's a death angel. Okay. God sent the death angel to take the firstborn of every family, of every livestock that was left, of everything that was, the, the firstborn was to be taken. And it was going to affect everybody in the land that God gave them a remedy that they could escape the death angel. God told Moses, tell the children of Israel to take a lamb for each family, slaughter the lamb, take the blood, put it on the doorposts. And anybody that would be in that house, either Jew uh, or Gentile, or at that time the nation of Israel really had not been forged yet, but either children of Abraham or, 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 or Egyptians, it didn't matter. Anybody that was in that house with the blood on the door would escape the plague of the death angel. The blood of the lamb. Now that blood itself had no effectual purpose. It was just blood. But it was the faith that they had to be in the house where the blood was, believing that God would protect them from the death angel. Because we're not, we're, we're saved by faith. Okay. So every year God told Moses, I want you to start a statue in Israel. That every year in the first of their month, the first month on the 14th of Nisan was the, was the month, that they would, they would have the Passover. And they would celebrate the Passover. And they would take a lamb and they would slay it. And there was a whole uh, uh, Seder, what we call today a Passover Seder. Many of you have been to a Passover Seder, a Messianic Seder, where they would sit down and they would eat the lamb and they would rehearse everything that happened on that night when they were delivered from the hand of the Egyptians. And every year from that point on, even till today, they go through the story of the Exodus and how God protected those who were under the blood. So when Jesus gathered with his disciples in Luke chapter 22 to celebrate the Passover, he was preparing to go through that, that, that Seder, that, that, that meal, where they would rehearse everything that had been done in Egypt. Now let's back up a little bit so we set the scene here in verse 1 of chapter 22. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew near, which is called the Passover, verse 2. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, Jesus, for they feared the people. If you read the Gospels up to this point, for three years, Jesus had been teaching and preaching and doing miracles, and he had been proclaiming himself as the Messiah of Israel. He had raised people from the dead, the anointed one of God who would be sent to bring deliverance to his people. He was raising people from the dead. He was healing blind people, healing sick people, doing things that nobody else could ever do. His preaching and his teaching all pointed to the fact that he was the Messiah. And when it talks about here these, these uh, scribes and chief priests, they understood exactly who he claimed to be. Some folks think, well, maybe they didn't really know who he was. They knew who he was. He was very clear about who he was. And while they should have got on their knees and on their faces and worshipped him, like the common people were doing, instead, they wanted to kill him. And somebody might say, well, why would they do that? Because he was threatening their position, their power. Everything that was important to them was being threatened by this guy named Jesus, who had not come up through their school who had not come up through their, their program. He came from a place that they thought nobody good could ever come from. 
So instead of bowing down and worshiping the anointed of Yahweh, the anointed of Jehovah, instead of doing that, they were planning on killing him. They didn't realize that they were planning on killing the real Passover lamb. For all the thousands, maybe millions of lambs that have been slain for the thousand or so years since the Exodus until now, every one of them pointed to this one. He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That's what John the Baptist said about him when he saw him. So they wanted to kill him. But they couldn't do it. You know, when he would teach out in the open, when he would be out in the, in the temple teaching or out in the streets, they didn't want to take him in because they would have a riot. So they were looking for a way they could grab him when nobody was looking. Verse 3. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. He was one of the, the inner circle, one of the twelve disciples. Chosen, by the way, by Jesus. Jesus chose him. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him unto them. And they were glad and covenanted to give him money. And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. He said, listen. Give me some money. I'll let you know where he's going to be when nobody else is going to be around. It's just be him and his buddies. And you'll be able to grab him in the middle of the night, sweep him off to the, you know, to the high priest. And by, by the time morning rolls around, he'll be in the hands of the Roman, and one, nobody going to mess with the Romans. Okay. Verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread. When the Passover must be killed. How many people know before you can have life, you've got to have death? A seed is planted in the ground. It doesn't do anything until it dies. And then it produces a plant that bears fruit. When God originally created everything, he created it to be good. Nothing ever died. He created us to live forever until sin entered in. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. So before we can deal with the sin problem, something got to die. When Adam and Eve were in the garden and they were naked, something had to die so that God could cover them with animal skin so they wouldn't be ashamed. He said the day of unleavened bread came when the Passover must be killed. Listen, if you want to have eternal life, you got to die. Not only physically, but the old man has to die. The Bible says you must be born again. You must be born again. Let's read on a little bit. He says, he sent Peter and John, saying, in verse 8, Go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when you are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water, follow him to the house where he enters in. And he shall say unto the good men of the house, The master says unto thee, Where is the guest chamber, where, where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room furnished there, make ready. So Jesus said, Listen, go into town. There's a guy that Jesus might have arranged this previously. He said, There's a guy there uh, with bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him. We'll get the thing set up. Now, when they had the last, what they call the Last Supper, We've all seen the picture of, you know, the Da Vinci with the Last Supper, when they're all sitting around a table, and he got the golden goblets and, you know, everything. That's not the way it was. Don't go by, don't go by popular art. <laughs> okay. When they would celebrate the Passover in ancient Israel, they would recline. The table would be maybe about a foot off the ground. And they would sit around the table and lean on their left. And they would eat with their right hand. And it would be, it would be around the table. And, so, and, and the goblets weren't golden. You know, there's no holy grail. People say, we're looking for the holy grail. There's, there's no such thing. They used common stuff that they would use for a Passover Seder. Today, they have special, you know, if you've ever been to one, they'll have special dishes. They might have had things just specially for the Passover Seder, but it wasn't jewel-encrusted, okay. They would sit down, and the chief places, now there are other times where Jesus talks about the chief place, the chief seat, okay? There were chief places to the right 
and to the left of the one who was uh, the head of the, the Seder, who this would be Jesus. We know, again from reading, putting all the Gospels together, we know that on one side next to him was John. He was the beloved disciple. He was the one that, uh, you know, was probably closest to Jesus. On the other side, who do you think was there? The one to whom he handed the sop. Judas. And, and really, on his, on, on his other side, that would be like the chief place. He gave Judas the chief place at that table. Jesus did. He knew what was coming. He knew what was going to happen. Okay. Now listen to what he says. And again, you can put all the Gospels together to get the whole picture, but we're just going to stay here in Luke. He said unto them, With desire, I have desire to eat this Passover with you, before I, what? Suffer. Jesus had told his disciples all along what was going to happen. He was going to suffer at the hands of the chief priests and so forth. They didn't hear him. They didn't want to hear that. They didn't listen to him. They thought that Jesus was going to be, they believed he was Messiah. They thought he was going to be the king. They thought he was going to kick the Romans out and take control and sit on the throne of David and they were convinced of that and they were ready to fight for it. But he said, I'm going to suffer. He says, verse 16, for I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now again, these disciples hearing this probably thought, this is it. Here's the last path. He talked about the kingdom. We want to see the kingdom of God on earth. So this is, this must, this is going to be it. But what Jesus was saying, he's saying it's going to be a long time. This is the last time we're going to be able to do this together for a long time. Listen to what he says. He says he took the cup and he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourself. Now this, this cup is not the cup of the Lord's table. We'll, we'll see that in a minute. This is when there were like three cups or four cups of blessing in the Passover Seder that they would pass around. He says, For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. Now, verse 19. And he took bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he gave unto them, saying, This is my body. Now, up until this point, wherever they would celebrate Passover, there would be the breaking of what they call the afikomen. They would take a piece of unleavened bread and break it, and it was, it's a part, of the, a part of the Passover Seder program that they have. This is something new. This is something nobody ever said this before in a Passover Seder. When he took that piece of bread, something that these Jews had seen year after year after year, he said something they had never heard before. He said, this is my body. When, when God told Moses that they had to celebrate the Passover every year, every year to mark their deliverance from Egypt, everything they did in that Passover was a picture of something Christ would do. Nobody that ever celebrated the Passover up to that time could legally or lawfully say, this is my body. But Jesus, the real Passover lamb, took the bread and broke it. And he said this, is my body. It's my body which is given for you this do in remembrance of me. We're going to do that in just a minute. In just a little while we're going to take communion. Likewise also the cup after supper saying this cup is the New Testament in my... He, nobody ever said that before. Nobody ever had the legal right to say this before he said it here. He said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of him that betrays me is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goes as it was determined. 
But woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. And listen to these disciples. These brave, loyal, dedicated disciples. They started looking at one another and saying, Is it me? Is it you? They began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. Is, is it you? Now if you put all the Gospels together again, it was John that asked Jesus, Hey Jesus, who is it? Secretly, quietly. And Jesus says, The one whom I give the sop. Piece of, a piece of bread dipped in the bitter herbs. He took it and he gave it and he gave it to Judas. He said, here Judas, go do what you got to do. Okay. Now listen, now listen to this. And this is just incredible to me. See, they, they're not getting the picture. They're hearing what they want to hear. Have you ever been there? You hear what you want to hear. People hear what they want to hear. You can always tell when somebody stops listening. You know, I can stand up here and look, and I tell when people stop listening. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. I don't always look real hard. Okay. And there was also a strife among them. What were they arguing about? I should be sitting at that place on that table. I should be. Who? Which of them should be accounted the greatest. God help us. Which of them should be the second in command? Which of them is going to have the most power? Which of them is going to have the most authority? Man, this goes on, listen, in what is called church today, this goes on all the time. People striving for position. They want to sit up on the platform on the bishop's chair. We had to take ours off to make room for the drums. They, they, had to, they want to be up front. They want to be the one to wear the big ring. They want to be the one with the... I was telling somebody this morning. I saw... Unbelievable. Of one of these men, and if I mentioned the name, you would know the name. Pastor of the big church. Got caught up in some, some, some sexual stuff. Right? His people just love him. He's still up there. He's still packing them out. And a guy went to his church. Listen, a guy went to his church and wrapped him in, in, a, in, a, in a Torah. You know what a Torah is? A Jewish scroll? And called him king. What's wrong with us? What is wrong with us in the church in the United States of America? Everybody wants to be great. Everybody wants to be the, the pastor. Everybody wants to be the bishop. Everybody wants to be an apostle. Do they know what the cost is? It's different than in the world. You know, in the world, you start at the bottom and you uh, climb up and you work your way up and you get to the top and you get powerful and you get money and you get position and that's great. It, Jesus says in the, in the body of Christ, it's the, it's the exact opposite. He said unto them in verse 25, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But you shall not be so, church. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that does serve. See, that doesn't mean nobody wants to be a servant. Nobody wants to be at the bottom of the flow chart. Everybody wants that position, you know, on the top floor. But Jesus said, don't you understand? If you read John's gospel, you know what he did in, in John chapter 13? You know what he did with his disciples? He got him, took off his outer garment, got a towel and a basin and began to wash the feet of the disciples, including Judas. And he said, if I, your master, do this to you, shouldn't you be willing to do this? You see, to become a servant, you know what has to happen? you got to die. To become and a, a, a disciple of Christ, you gotta, you got to die. I'm not talking about 
graveyard dead. That's going to happen soon enough. But I'm talking about you've got to die to yourself. You've got to die to the old man. You've got to be born again. You've got to be a new creature in Christ. And the only way we can find that is through faith in the blood of the Passover lamb. We got to be under the blood of Jesus Christ. That's where we got to be. He says, verse 27, For whither is greater, he that sits at me or he that serves? Is not he that sits at me, but I am among you as he that serves. You are they which have continued with me in my temptations. And I appoint unto you a kingdom as my Father has appointed unto me. You got the kingdom coming, guys. But it's not coming tomorrow. Oh, no. That you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, I bet you when they heard that, they just got all charged up because they, they have selective hearing. People hear what they want to hear. We do it all the time. We listen. And things that make us feel good perk up. And when something comes along, it's just not too good. We just kind of like... You know, turn off the, turn the volume down. Spiritual hearing aid. You know, you got them little. No. For where, whether is greater, he says, in verse 27, he that sits at meat or he that serves is not he that sits at meat, but I am among you as he that serves. See, Jesus knew that in just a couple hours, he knew what was going to happen. The man whose feet he washed, the man who he, who he put in the place of honor, would betray him and lead a band of soldiers to take him when nobody was looking. Take him to a mock trial in front of a, a tainted jury. He's going to lead him to where Jesus was. And Jesus knew he knew what he was going to suffer. He knew what was coming. Yet he was the servant of all. He went on and he said to Peter, and I've, 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 I've used this, this, this verse of Scripture so many times. I've told you before, but the first time I've preached this verse. He said to Peter, Simon, Simon, you know, we think of Judas as the horrible betrayer. But when Jesus was taken, they all left him. They all ran. And Simon, Peter, what was going to happen with him? He was going to deny that he ever even knew Christ. He said, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I prayed for you uh, that, the, that you, your faith doesn't fail. And when you are converted, strengthen your brother. And he says, Simon, you're about ready to go through something you can't even imagine. You're about ready to die, Simon. Can you just imagine Peter, those three days from the time he betrayed Christ to the time that Christ appeared to him? Can you imagine what was going on in his heart, Peter, who claimed he would never, uh, never leave him, and he would die for him, and he would pull out the sword and fight for him and everything? And he ran, he denied him with a curse. Can you just imagine? Have you ever, listen, have you ever died a thousand deaths? <laughs> Come on. Have you ever had something happen in your life where you felt like dying? Where every minute, every second, every hour, it's just, we've all been there at one time or another. You have a time in your life when you felt like you could, you could wish you could go back an hour or a day or a month and undo something you've done, some, some, something that, you've, that you have failed at, something, somebody that you've betrayed, somebody that you've abandoned. If you could just go back a year, 10 years, 20 years, how many know? And every time you think about it, you die a thousand deaths. See, that's okay. Because when you die, you can live. The Passover must be killed. And we, we got to die if we want to live. Jesus told Peter in Matthew chapter 
16, he, he told them, he says, those that love their life here is going to lose it, and those who are willing to lose their life here for my sake will find it. I want to look one more passage, and, then, and we're going to partake of the Lord's table. I guess I'm not going to keep it too long this morning. Over in 1 Corinthians, chapter 11. Look at verse... <coughs> Twenty-three. The Apostle Paul writes, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread that we just read about in Luke. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my, what, my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Every time you do this, remember what I did for you. And after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. The New Testament, not the Old Testament. This essentially, when, when Jesus celebrated this Passover Seder, he essentially ended Passover Seder, even though they keep celebrating them. He instituted something new. Paul says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he come. We look back at what he did, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, and we look forward to what he's going to do. He took my sins on the cross. He gave me the hope of eternity through faith in his blood. And he gave me a promise of his return. And here we are in the middle of his first and second coming. What do we do? As believers, I want to ask you this this morning. Have you died to yourself? Are you dead to sin? One more passage. I, I just got to, I hope I can remember where it is. Romans chapter 6. Look at verse uh, 5. The Apostle Paul writes, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his what? Death. Have you died? Are you a dead man or woman? You might say, man, I'm, I'm alive. I'm, I'm breathing. I'm... Have you died? Before, listen, before Christ can live in you, the old man got to die. The old man got to die. He says, if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Life comes from death. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, have you been crucified with Christ? That the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Are you dead this morning? The Passover must be killed. Are you dead this morning? Because if you're not dead this morning to yourself, you're still a slave to sin. You're still a servant of sin. The only way we can be free from the sin that so easily besets us is when we die to ourselves and live to Him. Verse 7, For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. 
knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more, death has no more dominion over him. If it doesn't have any more dominion over him, it doesn't have any dominion over us either. If he conquered sin and we're in Christ, guess what? We have conquered sin. Not in our own strength, not in our own willpower, not in our own self, but in Christ. In Christ we're dead to sin. There's another place in this chapter. Well, verse 11. Look at verse 11. We're going to, this, we're going to look at this and then we're going to have communion. Likewise, he said, oh, look at verse 10. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but that he lives, he lives unto God. Likewise, reckon yourselves, you guys have heard me preach on this verse probably a million times too. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed, un, uh, indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You need to reckon, you need to count yourself as having died. If you're in Christ, you say, I'm dead to sin. I don't have to live in sin anymore. I don't have to be a servant to sin anymore. Why? Because I'm a, such a good person or I've, you know, I've, uh, I have willpower? No. Because I'm covered with the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. My faith, just like their faith was in the, the blood of that Lamb that was on the doorpost and the lentils on, on, at, at the first Exodus, at the first uh, Passover, my faith is in the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. I am no longer a slave to sin. It has nothing to do with position or power or how long you've been saved or what church you go to or whether you're a pastor. Or what. It has nothing to do with any of that mess. It has to do with the blood of Jesus Christ. I get sick and tired of folks that get in some kind of office and get some kind of power or get some kind of uh, reverend in front of their name and they think they're some kind of big shot. They, they could be just as lost. <laughs> it's only the blood of Jesus. It's only the blood of Jesus. I want to ask you this morning. Now, I, I can't, you know what, one more, okay? One more. Over, over, in, over Galatians chapter 2, I just, you know, I just, these scriptures keep coming to my mind. I promise this is going to be the last one. You say, yeah, you promised that last time. Over in Galatians, we know where it is, right? Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul writes in verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Are you crucified with Christ this morning? Have you died with Christ this morning? Are you dead? Are you a dead man? He says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Oh God. But Christ lives in me. See, this life that which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This life I'm living, you know, my body's still alive. I'm still getting older. I'm still getting grayer. I'm still getting rough around the edges here and, and creaking around the joints. But this body, this life I'm living in this life, it's not mine anymore. It belongs to him. And I'm going to tell you something. There's a promise that God has made to me. He promised me that this isn't what I'm going to be stuck in for all of eternity. This body's going to be planted in the ground someday, and it's going to come up again, a resurrected the perfect body just like Jesus has right now. That's the promise. So this life I'm living in right now, it, is, it isn't through the power of my body or my flesh or my blood. It's through the power of Christ in me. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Jesus Christ lives within me. Somebody want to go ahead and mention to the kids that come up as we prepare to partake of the Lord's table. I want to ask you this morning, wherever you're at, whoever you are, as I said, our communion is an open communion. We don't limit it to our members. But the Bible says you must be born again. I want to ask you if you've been born again. Somebody say, what does that mean? That means to put your faith in the blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and allow him to be your Lord and your Savior. None other. It's not about church. It's not about a pastor. It's not about power. It's not about, it's about Christ. That's our hope of forgiveness, our hope of eternity. I want to pray as we wait for the kids to come up. I want to pray. If there's anybody in here that does not know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and you want to make him your Lord and Savior, 
I'm not asking you to join this church. That's a whole different ballgame. It's a whole different thing. I'm not going to ask you to put your hand up. I'm not going to ask you to, you know, close your eyes. By, I'm not going to do that. Where you're, seat, where you're seated, where you're sitting, if you've never made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, I want you to pray with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I know I need a Savior. I'm a sinner, and I'm lost. I know that if I were to die today, I would not have a hope of being accepted into your kingdom. Father, I pray that you would forgive my sins through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. It says in your word that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Father, we call on your name this morning. We call on the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, this morning. Father, we need salvation. We need to die to ourselves so we might live to you. We need to become dead men and women that we might live to you, O God. I wanted to ask you if you could stand with me, if you could all stand with me. We're going to pray in... Uh, Brother D-Roy is going to come around and lead you around in, uh, as, uh, as, you could, as you could go. And uh, we want everybody to receive who wants to receive and wait until everybody receives. And then we'll take communion together, okay? But I just want to pray, Father, as we prepare to partake of your table this morning. God, if there is one in here that has never made you their Lord and Savior. If there is one in here who has never called upon the name of the Lord. If you're here this morning and you're hearing this message and you're thinking, man, I'm, I, I don't know, I've never, I've never trusted Christ. Listen, when we, when we come up to receive the elements, come up and let me pray with you. Come up and let me, just let me, let, let me pray God's blessing on you. If, if you've, for the first time this morning, you have received Christ as your Lord and Savior, just come up and let me pray with you. Your eternity depends upon it. And I want to say this, if you're not saved, you know, our communion is open to anybody who is saved. But if you're not saved, and you, and, and you, you hear and you understand, and you take communion, it could, be, it could be deadly. The Apostle Paul says, many are sick and many sleep. Because they don't understand, that they don't, they, they've taken communion unworthily. What makes you worthy to receive the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? The blood of Jesus shed on Calvary. That's the only thing. So if this morning, for the very first time, you've asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, just stop up on your way up and I might have a word of prayer with you. I'm going to ask D-Roy, won't you come? And, Brother Albert, could you come and just play softly? Uh, you know, uh, there is a fountain. D-Roy, won't you come and begin uh, leading? <laughs>